Hi there, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us this evening. My name is Jesse Zebart. I am the Cultural Programs Manager at the Bainbridge Island Museum of Art. I would like to first acknowledge that BIMA is located on the indigenous ancestral land of the Sklalem, Suquamish, and Coast Salish peoples, living in harmony with the lands and waterways along Washington Central Salish Seas, as they have for thousands of years. The Coast Salish are committed to honoring and protecting the waters of their ancestors for future generations, generations as promised by the Point Elliott Treaty of 1855. Thank you for joining us tonight. Untold Stories is a dynamic series of free online lectures, panels, and conversations which inspire, empower, and educate through the art of storytelling. For information on our upcoming Untold Stories events and other BIMA programs, please visit www.biartmuseum.org. I want to remind everyone that we will have question and answers and Brenda will explain how they're going to handle that this evening. So think about some questions um, that you might have for them as they're presenting this evening and reminder to please be respectful and compassionate when you're submitting those comments and questions. Untold stories between two worlds growing up with undocumented parents in Kitsap County is presented this evening in partnership with Kitsap advocating for immigrant rights and equality otherwise known as CARE. Tonight, you will hear from Alejandra Pulido and care, a CARE youth leader who will share her experience of growing up in Bremerton with undocumented parents. The conversation will be hosted by fellow CARE leader, Brenda Calderon. Together, they will connect the importance of maintaining a global focus while organizing in Kitsap to foster international solidarity. So I'm gonna go ahead and hand this over to Alejandra and Brenda, and thank you all again for joining us this evening. Take it away. Great, thank you so much, Jesse. Um, hi, everybody. Thank you for coming today for our conversation with CARE. Uh, really quickly, I am. my name is Brenda Calderon. I am a CARE leader. I've been living in Washington, Kitsap County for the last three years, and I'm a farmer here. I grew up in LA with, um, raised by my parents who were both migrants from Mexico, um, from Durango, Mexico specifically. And yeah, I got my BA in art in New Mexico State. Um, so I've been around the borderlands for a long time and really have seen and experienced a lot um, of different perspectives. And so now here I am organizing in Kitsap County with my other fair ca fellow care leaders. Alejandra, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah. Hi, my name is Alejandra Polito. Um, I am the daughter of immigrant parents. Surprise. Um, I am a senior at Brampton High School. Really excited to graduate, hopefully going to college after. And um, you'll know more about me in my story. So shall I begin? Um, yeah, so we'll just, we'll probably, we'll take questions like at the end of different sections. We have a few um, sections that we're going to go through and then we'll ask and see if anybody has any questions that they uh, want us to address. Um, yeah, uh, so I'll, I'll talk about CARE and how we formed or what our focus is. So CARE is a grassroots immigrants migrant led organization that focuses on addressing inhumane working conditions in our community. Um, our goal is to change and create policies along with organizing in our uh, for work yeah in the community for equality and justice uh, we are cultivating a future that is rooted in collective work towards justice and understanding so that immigrant culture labor and knowledge can be uplifted valued and celebrated um, we know that our immigrant migrant communities are an essential part of our production systems here in the u.s which has always relied heavily on an exploitable workforce to sustain itself. So um, these perspectives are often not um, addressed or brought light to, they're often kept quiet. And so today we just wanna talk a little bit about some of the demographics of people here and experiences here. Um, so I'm just going to tell you a little bit about uh, the population here in, in Kitsap and Washington State specifically. Um, in 2016, we found that immigrant migrants made up about 23% of the population in Washington State. 
of, the, of that 23%, 240,000 were undocumented. As of March of 2020, there were over 16,000 DACA recipients residing in Washington. That's the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals um, that was started during the Obama administration. In 2016, we saw undocumented immigrants made up about 5% or one in five of the uh, Washington workers. Undocumented folks generally work in agriculture. Um, so either picking fruits or, or vegetables. And here specifically, we have a lot of brocha pickers who work for companies that do floral arrangements. Um, they're also often found as in cleaning and maintenance positions, restaurants, landscaping, to just name a few. Um, some issues that may arise for undocumented workers in, in their workplaces uh, may be not receiving adequate breaks or just wages. Um, there's very often, it's really rare for them to have any access to health care, which is a, a huge issue. Um, they also don't receive sick leave most of the time. So we can see that during the pandemic that greatly impacts this workforce and these communities because without access to health care or sick leave, they often go to work still sick and are at risk and put other people at risk at um, contracting COVID or anything else. Um, and it's really difficult for undocumented workers to speak up about these injustices because they they are often threatened with deportation. So any any injustices that may be occurring in their workplace um, will be could be met with retaliation, right, for being deported or being detained in one of the detention centers here, which would be an even worse outcome for them. Um, also, if it's their job stability, their income, uh, speaking up and shaking things up may not be as desirable if they don't have a guarantee, another guaranteed form of income that, that can replace that stream. So it, it really jeopardizes a lot and puts them in a place where they feel that they don't have a choice and they generally just continue to work in those conditions because they feel maybe fortunate enough to have a job or it's one of the only places that they can work without being documented. So um, the choices are really limited. Um, so yeah, so if Alejandra wants to share part of her story here. Thank you, Brenda. Um, here, let me share my screen. I'll show you guys a photo. Hmm. Where is it? Aha. Hi. So I will say, tell my story and um, I'll answer questions at the very end. So if you see, this is my father and I at the Evergreen Park. Yep, little monkey, little coconut me. So I'll begin. I like to begin by telling you that I'm currently in a bit of fear as title undocumented makes me hope that there won't be an angry soul out there that decides to make it their mission to have my parents deported. This has been my fear for my whole life, coming home from school and not having my parents home. When I had the opportunity of studying in a different country during the summer 2019, all I could see on the news were ICE raids. I would watch on TV, seeing how they would be alerting different areas of the country for ICE. My folks were a couple miles away from the target here in Washington. So all I could hope is that I'd be coming back home to my mother and father. People always say, why then to come legally? I support legal migration. And after repeating the same points about the corrupt system that we have and how expensive it is to come to this country and so on, I can only respond with a, do your damn research from unbiased sources then come back to me. Now, I know it probably sounds a bit rude, but I personally think it's rude to call my parents aliens. When I think about aliens, I think of lean green beings and spaceships from outer space. So why is it appropriate to continue calling people like my parents who want a better life aliens? I remember when I was five or six, my mother took me to Seattle with her because she needed to go to some building to see if she could get in line for citizenship. I, I don't remember much, but I remember 
but she was holding some legal documents and I saw the word alien. I questioned her about it and all, all she could say was, that's what they call us. I also think it's rude to make it impossible for people to come to a new land that has been stolen. I think it's rude to let my parents stay undocumented in this country for 20 years now. My father, he's been installing carpets for, carpet for 20 years now. He's currently 60 years old, no crimes, no drinking and driving. He doesn't have insurance and he pays his taxes. But the only issue is that he happened to be poor before coming to land of the free. Every single time I watch my father and saw a carpet, it just, it makes me cry. I wish he could retire. He wheezes as he hits the tools he uses with his knee to make your carpets perfect. His knees and hands are swollen now and he still goes to work. There's been occasions where he can't stand up or go downstairs. We tried going to the doctor, but they only respond by giving him pills for his prediabetes which the pills have given him what we believe is stroke. We can't go back because every single time we do, they give him the same pills and they're expensive. So thank you to God, he's recovered and he still has a job and a roof over our heads. I have a blurry memory of thinking that my father is going to last until maybe my eighth grade year, four years ago. And my mother, well, she hasn't seen her mother in 18 years, almost 19 years now. It's painful to watch her cry about my grandma, who I haven't met in Mexico. Her health has been very critical for the past couple of years, and all we can do is send her money for her surgeries. They don't go to the doctor. They can't go to the dentist. They don't receive money from the state. They are good people. But America wants them as slaves for their money. That's what I believe. When I grew a bit older, seven, eight, nine, that's when I began translating for my parents from English to Spanish. It would be from legal documents to asking the store clerk for an item and still to this day I help them. Stop speaking taco, stop speaking Mexican is a common phrase you'll hear, many Spanish speakers will hear in this country, the country without an official language. Once I was in fifth grade, my mother felt encouraged to work as a groove to be more independent. I was going off to middle school. Um, she wanted to work for herself and work for my, more money to send her to her mom. And she found a job and I'd help her clean there. I'd go with her on weekends and we'd walk in the dark by herself. She didn't know how to drive. But there came a point where I matured a bit more and I understood the discrimination my mother was facing with her boss. My first argument with a stranger was about politics. <laughs> One hot summer day when I was 15, I went to work with my mother and I was helping her clean the lint to dry windows after some small talk with my mother's boss, I glanced over at my mom working and raised an issue that has been bothering me. I asked her, why are you paying my mother $8 an hour when minimum wage is $13.50? She works very hard for you and you know that. She's illegal, said my mom's boss of conviction. My son is a lawyer and he said it was fine. My mind would just flash to what I just told you. My father having a stroke and my mother crying. And I got mad. In the middle of a busy laundromat, I could feel eyes watching as our voices rose. Many of those eyes belonged to undocumented Russia workers I knew. As I defended the migrant community as best I could, I remember a white man with a, not, he's a pretty nice man bun stepping in to defend my mother's boss who slipped away, leaving me to argue with someone who called me naive, young, uneducated, anti-American. And just as is normal, he said, and it's their fault. All I could say is wanting to survive is so bad. My emotions took over and I interrupted him more and more, feeling like a hypocrite for him to insist listening to me. Eventually he got tired of me and left. So if, you grow, if you've also grown up in documented parents, you're probably also angry with this country and, and its system. I've set my life purpose to fix this corrupt system. I like to say, my mom taught me how to clean, so now I shall clean this country's corruption as best I can. <laughs> it's a reach, I know. Um, I really hope to run for Congress, Governor, and possibly POTUS one day, and I am serious. Um, my male peers have said they'd vote for their idiot <laughs> adrenaline junkie friend over me only because I'm a woman. My parents, on the other hand, are terrified of my ambitions. They say politics is a dirty world, but they've come to accept that helping others makes me happy and that I'm aware about what I would be possibly getting to is what I want. Growing up, my father told me that because I'm a woman of color, 
and a woman, <laughs> Hispanic, I'll need to work a million times harder than the white male. I didn't believe him at first, but there has been events at school and competitions where the results shocked me. And I began to believe, but I, I just began to believe it. And at the end of the day, I guess I thought that this is just to grow me stronger for my future. And a little FYI, I never received help from my parents to, on projects and homeworks in middle and high school. My parents only made it to high school and I was originally going to talk about their independent stories, but it's a sensitive topic, but I'm not, and I'm not comfortable talking about it yet. It, it's scary, but I can say that I'm grateful for them as I have food in my fridge ready for whenever I'm hungry. I don't have to walk two miles for semi clean water. I have a roof over my head, warm blankets when it's cold. I have clean clothes without holes in them unless I'm purchasing clothes, put trendy clothes with cl holes in them. <laughs> <laughs> and I have access to so many opportunities here in the US and the list can go on. So those who receive help or have received help on their pre-calculus homework in the middle of the night from a family member, be grateful. I'm currently a brown student. I'm depressed, I'm isolated, I'm scared, I'm ambitious and I'm not the only one. It's only like, three years until I can petition for my parents so they can at least see a, a light at the end of the tunnel for retirement. Maybe for my mom to be able to see her mother again. Now that I'm reaching to the end of my high school career, I'm now heading off to college. I'm all on my own for paying my college tuition and I'm currently praying for Stanford to see my potential and for him to want me. I'm going to be the first one in my family to graduate from high school and in the future college. And I'm very grateful for my parents' sacrifices. So thank you for listening to my story and what I would call a mini rant. <laughs> I'm not open to any questions right now before moving on. Let me stop sharing. Thanks for sharing, Alejandra. That's so beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, let's see. I'm not seeing any questions, so maybe we'll wait and see till the end. Some stuff might pop up. Okay. Okay. Great. Um. Right. So. Yeah. Wow. Um. I'm still just taking it in. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, it was a bit too much. <laughs> no. No. It was perfect. I love it. I love it. It was just. Yeah, I just love to hear you talk about things. Um, right, so yeah, you know, you, ta you talked about a lot of different things. Um, gaining uh, citizenship for your parents, but having a pathway. Oh, Marsha Cutting is with us. She says, go Alejandra. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, so we'll move on to, um, issues with immigration. So basically the primary issue that we see that we're facing um, in our immigrant undocumented communities is that uh, immigration has become criminalized and um, it's been this way for some time, right? Um, it's not anything new. Um, I know that when my father came to the US, uh, he came when he was 18 and that was like back in the 60s, um, he definitely faced a lot of racism, was deported multiple times, and um, and finally gained citizenship, and eventually um, my mother joined him and stuff. But um, yeah, so America has had a pretty interesting history on uh, with things like the Bracero program in like the 40s and stuff that uh, allowed workers to cross over through the border to the U.S., and um, and made it legal for them to to go back and forth. And currently, we have certain programs that do allow. Um, it's the HB two A and the H HB two V two B, I think, program that um, allows uh, like Central American, South American people to come into the U.S. with a visa to work for about two to three years and, or just a season, depending on the visa. Um, but in really when we saw um, 
when we saw an increase in in like really strict immigration policies was after the 9-11 attacks during the Bush administration. So Bush was actually like pushing on some some pretty intense uh, immigration reforms that he had in, in mind. And after the 9-11 attacks uh, that set off a series of policies that really restricted and criminalized more people um, attempting to make a living in the US. So. In 2006, uh, Bush announced the end of the catch and release um, policies that had led to, which um, before when people came to, to the border, they, would, they could turn themselves in, say they came, they'd be given a court date or something to appear, and they'd have time to just to stay in the US in the meantime while they waited for um, their appearance. Uh, but in 2006, when that ended, that's when detention centers, funding for detention centers inc increased. And um, we saw more funding also for Customs and Border Patrol and um, just the Department of, um, sorry, the, yeah, the of Homeland Security, the Department of Homeland Security started receiving, was created and started receiving a lot of the funding more than other forces combined. Um, and so then the Border Patrol increased and um, they staffed more people and it became a lot more rigorous down at the, at the southern border specifically. And um, since then, detention centers have come to be known as important sources of revenue for, for private sectors um, that are most lucrative when the beds are full. And um, and we've seen in the past few years how many people have died in these detention centers out of neglect and um, really just the, the terrible conditions that they're living in. And a lot of these people are also trans women who are fleeing um, gender-based gender violence from their countries. Um, so it's, it's a really, yeah, it's a really grave situation. Um, that people face as they're coming in and they're being uh, further criminalized by, by these perspectives and, and basically it for, for profit, right? Um, so here in, in Washington, we have the Northwest Detention Center, which is in Tacoma. And um, it's actually been reported that they hold more people in solitary confinement than any other detention center in the nation. Um, and yeah, right, they've definitely had some COVID cases happen there. I know several groups were advocating for the release of a lot of detainees in order to reduce the spread of COVID, but that has not necessarily been um, really addressed. I know I just saw that a report about a recent COVID case there. Um, let's see, okay, there's a question about your presentation, Alejandra. I don't know if you wanna. Yeah, I was just typing it, but. Uh, oh. Okay. Thank you for the question. Um, I'll just read it out loud. It said, what a beautiful photo. Are you Alejandra able to matric matriculate at university at this point? How is it that you can petition for them in three years as a US born person? And would your parents qualify for health insurance from Affordable Care Act? First of all, thank you for your question and for the photo, um, the compliment on the photo. Um, so I've applied to 15 schools. Um, I just got acceptance today for my first um, safety school, Central Washington, but um, the school I go to will depend on the financial the financial aid I receive because like um, I'm all on my own on paying for college and I know that it's quite expensive and people um, pay their debts for years. Um, how I can petition for them in three years that's what I, I personally don't really know. I just know that I've talked to a lawyer here and there and they would repeat the same thing. If I look it up, it, it will be the same thing. I know that they ask for letters from peers saying that like my father is a awesome person who works very hard and deserves this. I know that that's a step, but I personally don't know. So I have to see in a couple years. I know that each document would cost from 200 to $500 each. So we'll have to fund a lot of money. 
Um, and will my parents call for health insurance through the Affordable Care Act? Yes, because I think the Affordable Care Act um, covers residents here in Washington and my peeps are residents here in Washington. So thank you for your question. I hope that answered it. Yeah, right. There's a, a oh. lot. <laughs> what was that? So oh, more. let me read. Oscar, I'm 28 years old on DACA and I can set I can second everything that you have gone through. Have you shared your experience with your peers and friends, teachers? What have been the responses? Is there a deal response you wish you could hear or do you prefer to keep that private? Um, I can say this. So many of the people that um, I am able to feel vulnerable to, I'm able to open up, do know about my parents um, being undocumented. My close family friends know that my parents are undocumented and they've been really positive. Um, they've been really supportive of my parents. They um, help my parents. Um, a person who I can say is Annie Sayo, she's helped. Um, Lizzie Dog, city councilwoman, she's been very helpful and supportive. Um, my teachers, they said whenever I'm like either panicking or I'm like really stressed out because I just talked to my father's tax accountant, um, they help motivate me and make me feel better because you know um, they they understand. So thank you, Oscar. Um, Kimmy, Alondra, for the beautiful story. You and your family have suffered a lot of injustice, but you tell it honoring your parents, understanding your strength. Your grace and inner beauty speaks volumes about who you are and how you have been shaped by the pride you have for your experiences. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I appreciate that. Okay, anyway, unless there's anything else, I'll move on. <laughs> okay. Awesome. Right. Um, so yeah, I was going to read a quick poem by Yosimar Reyes, who is an, a queer undocumented poet from uh, California. And this poem is called A Poem So That the Weight of This Country Does Not Crush You. Um, some days you may wake up sad. Some days you may wake up frustrated. Some days you may wake up tired. Some days you may wonder if it's worth it. Some days you may question your own growth. Some days you may think on how immense the world is to be caged in this country, to be subjugated to all this abuse. Some days you just want to breathe. And baby, I am here to remind you to sit in those moments, to sit in that whirlpool, but just to know that there are people like me picking up the load when you can't. There are people like me pushing so that the weight of this country does not crush you. That there are people like you who will fight when I can't. We will take turns pushing against these walls. I got your back and you got mine. And in the scheme of things, does anything else matter? Even if, in our, even if, our, if our fight is unfruitful, we will depart. With our dignity intact, we will depart knowing that this country is losing a prized possession. This country is losing the gift of our resilience. We will watch them as they tear into each other's skins and thank the heavens we never turned beasts like them. Um, yeah, uh, I think, yeah, it's just a, a really great piece. Um, that really speaks to right the position of like being an advocate and being someone who 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 feels really tied to the work. Uh, my parents were documented. I have the privilege of being documented, but I have had a lot of friends and um, people in my life who have been undocumented who have struggled with um, their parents being deported or you know just facing different different issues in that realm and um yeah it is pretty crushing it's hard even um to keep that in mind as a form of privilege for me of being documented to see um i'm not sure if there are to see that um yeah that a lot of things that i do easily or that i don't think about doing twice um, are things that people who are undocumented don't necessarily have access to, like 
traveling home to see their parents or their grandparents if, if they're sick or, you know, before they pass or anything. Um, so yeah, it can be a pretty crushing weight for a lot of people. Um, so yeah, uh, Alejandra, do you want to talk about some of the care campaigns that we have had? Yes, but we had a quick question from... Oh. Let's see. Uh, oh, uh, so Kay. Kay says, Brenda, very moving poem. Thank you. I just wonder about the Tacoma Detention Center. Is it better to try and close it down completely or to advocate for improvement in conditions here in Washington rather than the injustices to some other state that will perpetuate them? What is the goal for this? Um, so ideally, it would we want to abolish ICE. So we want to abolish the Immigration and Customs Enforcement. We definitely want to abolish the Department of Homeland Security, right? So this is all just created really from a fear-based place. Um, and it polices a lot of people and exploits a lot of people. And I think one of the things that we're seeing now um, with hopes of the Biden, Biden administration, right? We're seeing that he he's having some aggressive immigration reforms or promises of an aggressive immigration reform. Um, but he was part of the administration that deported over 3 million people, um, that one of the highest rates of any other previous um, presidencies. So really it's uh, abolishing detention centers, abolishing ICE is really the goal, I feel. And um, that's really where we have to start because these people do not need to be detained. Most of them, um, I know the the slogan for, for Obama was, right, um, like criminals, what was it? Felons, not families. Like they're not trying to deport families, but they end up breaking up a lot of families and separating them. And, um, and that's not something that we need to improve on, right? We don't need to improve the conditions of these detention centers. We just need to create pathways for people to have citizenship, to have asylum or refugee status that, that they need. Um, and really, I think one of the other um, initiatives that I heard about Biden's new reform was um, providing some funding for Central American countries to try and kind of rectify the previous US military aid that had been given um, out there. So really it's just our presence in those countries and how we affect their governments and how we further push people into poverty, right? And so we're gonna go into that a little bit um, with the with imperialism and forced migration uh, once we get to that section. So real quick, we'll just talk about some of the campaigns that CARE has led here in Kitsap County. Yeah, so the, I think the most recent campaign we've had is fundraising PPE and gas cards for our local grocery workers, which was very successful. We were able to fundraise for about up to 25 families, give or take. Um, and it was extremely urgent due to the summer forest fires that we had here in Washington. Um, and we are currently um, collecting information from workers, construction workers, restaurant workers, brochure workers, people who are, um, are scared of telling, saying so much information because they fear that if exposed or um, their stories are out, but they'll lose their job, the only job they have. But um, we've received information that some workers earn sometimes $9 an hour, some $15 a day. So um, what's another campaign we've had, Brenda? Um, right, so when care first started, um, we were involved in some of the um, 
some of the legal connecting uh, when there was the ICE raids back in 2019. So we connected with um, the Washington Immigrant Solidarity Network or WISEN, who is Seattle based. And they have uh, basically like a hotline where if you see ICE, <clears throat> ICE present anywhere, you can call there and tell them. And um, there's like a protocol for like verifying the, um, the place and that it was ICE and if there were any people who were taken. Um, so yeah, back in 2019, in that summer where a few people got swept up, we were involved in connecting them with some lawyers and, and trying to help them um, kind of figure out that situation. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, and so, yeah, right now we were just focused on getting some information and connecting more with undocumented people. There's a lot of barriers there in terms of um, their participation, right? We want this organization to be led by undocumented immigrants. Right now it's led by descendants of immigrants. Um, I'm first generation, so, yeah, so we wanna have undocumented folks doing the work. Right now, we're just trying to connect with them and um, gather more information about their situations. And it is difficult because they don't have time. They have, you know, they have work, it's COVID. <laughs> Nobody wants to meet in person or trust the stranger. Um, so yeah, so there's a lot of like community work that, that needs, that is being done on, on our side at this point. Um, and we had a few questions. Let me see. I saw it in the chat. Um, so it says for both of us, um, how has doing social justice work shaped who you are and how do you want it to shape who you become and what you study in college? I think that's for you, Alejandra. Where is that question? I don't see in it. The chat. Oh, hi. Do you see it? Yes, so how has it shaped who I am? Well, I've always thought that I've always been really open-minded, but as I've been open-minded, I've been absorbing so much information um, and it has helped me become a greater leader, better public speaker, less shy. I'm actually a kind of a shy person, even though some people won't believe it. I, <laughs> um, and it makes me so happy because I love seeing smiles on people's faces. And even though I wish I could be out there helping donate food, like give food to the homeless, I because of COVID, I, I can't risk my my father and my grandma. But um, it it really help. It really makes me happy being able to help people and have that effect. So I think social justice work is perfect for me. <laughs> and how do you, how do you want it to shape who you become and what you study in college? Well, when I go to college, depending on which college, I'll either be studying political science or government with a minor in business. And then I'll be heading off to law school. Um, I, I wish to become a human rights lawyer and um, been a politician once I turn 25 okay. and older. But if let's just say for chance, um, politics isn't my thing, then I'll gladly be a human rights lawyer or immigration lawyer. So um, I'm very excited for my future. <laughs> what about you, Brenda? Um, <laughs> was that for me too? Um, let's see, let me go back to it. Um, yeah, how can talk about social justice work? Right, um, let's see. Yeah, so it's, it's really closely tied to my livelihood right? Um, like I said, I grew up in LA in a Latinx community with immigrants from all over um, Caribbean, Central American, um, Mexico. And so really just um, being immersed in that growing up and hearing people's stories uh, swimming over from El Salvador, just, you know, different situations. Um, one of my neighbors was fled from Cuba during, you know, when Fidel Castro took over. There's just like so much history there. And um, all of that just kind of shaped my, 
my cultural identity and um, also going to school in New Mexico and seeing a lot of a lot of my fellow students were re had received um, scholarships for being agricultural workers at a young age. So they were children who were working in the fields and they had a program that gave them scholarships to go to school. Um, and so that's that's who was, you know, who I was making friends with in, in, in my department, my art department and stuff. And um, yeah, just kind of seeing all the different aspects, even though I didn't have a similar story to them in terms of like my immigration status. Um, it really changed my perspective. Uh, the fact that the majority of the time are we cannot tell our personal stories. Um, usually ac like academia tends to take those narratives and feels entitled to presenting them. So instead of having the people who are living it and experiencing it and giving them credit to be able to tell their own stories, their the narratives are taken and um, and just kind of stolen from them, I feel like. Um, so that really started to take over a lot of how I perceive things and my identity. And then coming into farming and agriculture, I was surrounded by a lot of undocumented workers. Um, and that's really when I started seeing also during the Trump administration, right? Um, that's when I started seeing more threats of like deportations for people and it became more immediate and just really intertwined the disparities and the wages for um, small sustainable farms, which is what I work for versus conventional farms who have the, the large exploitable workforce um, and how uh, it's really more of a white livelihood when it's a small sustainable farm and then it's a, people of color livelihood when it's, when it's at a conventional large scale. So yeah, so social justice just became like completely directly tied to my day-to-day -day job because I'm focused on food production and um, being sustainable and regenerative with the land and, um, and then also living on occupied territory and um, tribal territories and stuff, right? So it just um, has really also helped me come out of, I'm also a very introverted person. So it, it has pushed me to, um, to speak up about injustice because it's not something that I wanna be silent about and it's not something that I wanna be passive about. It's hard for me to talk about things or you know articulate in certain ways, but um, it really has helped push me a lot in terms of putting my myself aside and doing this for the community and um, yeah, just dedicating myself to it. That definitely, yeah, I think I went on a rant there, but <laughs> I got distracted, yeah. Um, and then there's one more question that says, what is your ideal immigration process? What are the best practices that and hopes you have? Um, I don't feel that I can super uh, answer that. I think having less uh, economic barriers to citizenship, right? Like what Alejandra was saying, um, it's pretty expensive to, to apply for citizenship just for the lawyers, the fees, all the things, even as a DACA, right? For a DACA recipient, it's a lot of annual fees that you know, every year you have to raise like $500, $600 to pay for this or a couple grand. Um, and um, yeah, it's it's really inaccessible to a lot of people. So especially if you're coming in from, from a poverty stricken country, um, yeah, it's gonna be difficult to to make that, to raise that money and probably a shorter process. I know some of the timelines have been between the timeline that they're saying now with this Biden proposal is like eight years. That seems like if it's not done within one administration, it can change. And that makes it probably more difficult for people to actually be guaranteed um, citizenship. I don't know if you have anything to add to that, Alejandra. Mm, what else can I add? Well, I feel like 
immigration is seen as people think that there won't be enough space in this country um, and that if we make it legal, then like so many people will want to come to this country, but it's really um, the US imperialism and uh, people just wanting to live. You have to realize um, people just don't really have to put yourself into those feet. Like, um, am I going to let my child starve or do I risk um, being called a criminal and letting my child have the future they want? Um, I personally think that we should take up, they take down the border. Uh, my father, I didn't put this part in the story. He came on the plane and many immigrants come on planes. They don't cross the border. There are some that do, but my father told me that he was on the plane and he was drinking whiskey all the way down to here. There are people who come on short-term visas and expires and it makes them undocumented. Um, I personally would make it, um, I'd, I want there to be a program for them to like immediately be put into like a job so that they can work, you know, or we can like make it into like three years for them to receive their visas. But um, talking about the US imperialism, um, many immigrants want to come here, send money, then go back to their native country. They, many don't want to stay here. So if we can either, it may sound crazy, dec decriminalize drugs in Latin America or other countries mm -hmm. and make it more safe for them to stay there with their families, then I, I think that will be progress. I wish I had a plan already. <laughs> oh, right. Let's continue. <laughs> yeah, so real quickly, we'll just go through, I'm not sure how much time we have left, um, 10 minutes. Okay, yeah, so we'll just talk about, um, we're members of this organization called um, EMA, which is the International Migrant Alliance. Um, and it's a, an organization made up of immigrants who are united in the struggle against imperialism, fascism, and forced displacement of people. So as a part of CARE, um, we believe that imperialism is the root of forced migration. Um, many people have left their home countries due to effects from imperialist econ economic sanctions policies and military, military aid and occupations um, in their territories. So they end up seeking refuge in countries like the US or other Western imperialist countries who promise uh, a, access to a better life. Um, but really they are being displaced by those countries specifically and, um, and they're being exploited by those countries, right? Whether it's exporting labor or, um, or yeah, military aid to governments and regimes that are exploiting their, their citizens. Um, so yeah, so it's really important for us to keep, um, as we're organizing in Kitsap County to keep a international focus because that's really where all of it originates, right? So it's, it's not just happening here in Kitsap, it's, um, this is like a side effect of of something that happened 20 years ago, like in the 80s or the 40s, or you know, just um, time that has passed. And um, so it's really, yeah, we're really focused on on having that wide perspective, um, so that we can organize better and be in solidarity with people around the world. One of our examples currently is um, Care has called the community into action to support the Philippine Human Rights Act to cut US funding for military aid to the Philippines um, in response to Duter Duterte's um, devastating human rights violations. So, so yeah, so it, it, that's one of the, one of the things that, that we're definitely behind right now. And, and we're trying to push people to here and local government in Kitsap to see that we do have a really large Filipino community and we want um, to advocate for the countries that um, that are original to them and to their homeland um, specifically because their presence is here and even if it wasn't it would still be really important um, because it impacts immigration and it impacts people here. Also one of the things that um, is not commonly thought of is that immigration is a black issue. A lot of immigrant migrant people originate from like 
uh, Africa or um, Caribbean countries. And, um, and so it's also closely tied to BLM um, and uh, yeah, and to other, other issues. Do you have anything to add to this, Alejandra? Nope, nothing to add. Okay, so I think there was a few questions. There was one more question that I saw in the chat. Uh, what part does fear play in all of this? How has experiencing fear, managing the fear of others, et cetera, impacted your outlook or informed your work? Hmm. You have fear, but you, you can't really allow it to take over. Um, I know my father, um, he, I grew up, uh, you know, let's say I was scared of a spider or something like a presenting for the first time. And he said, all the fear that we have is in your head. The only natural fear that we have is the fear of falling. So of course we all have that internal fear, but you just have to ignore it and continue and keep fighting hard. You know, there's, I guess my answer is I just ignore it and I don't let it get to me sometimes. So there, I think last night I was actually, I, I was actually in a panic mode. I'll be vulnerable. I was, um, uh, cause I was just thinking about my dad and let's say I was just overthinking it way too much. And I, I started crying because I, I feel emotions deeply. And when I see on the news, but of parents and kids being separated and being like, oh, that could, that could be my father and I, it could be my, my mother and I. And it's really easy to get involved with my fear, but you know, uh, keep working hard <laughs> and hope for the best. Do you have anything to add, Brenda? <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, I feel like for me, the fear comes in terms of, um, of it's not enough, right? Like, I, I think that's really the biggest, the biggest thing is like, oh, you know, like everything that we're doing is just not gonna be enough to change this or like, we just don't have enough people doing the work and um, being dedicated to this. Uh, so yeah, sometimes I think there's a fear of like not necessarily contributing as much as, or changing as much as we could as fast as we can. Um, I think, I think I see more the fear in terms of um, the hesitation for people to engage or people saying that you have to be patient with, with this progress and process. And, um, and I, I definitely don't feel that way. I feel like we can make these changes now. We just all have to like sit down and, and really address it. Um, so yeah, so for me, I think it's mostly just like fear of, of not doing enough. And, and so I have to step back and, and uh, give myself time to boundaries, <laughs> time to like, yeah, just have my own, my own separate time. And I don't have to sacrifice myself <laughs> for something. I 100% agree. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, we had one question from Ashley Marie, Facebook. What inspires you? Uh, I had this question on a college application essay. I think what inspires me first off is my parents. Of course, um, I grew up, my, my father would always tell me, um, do it yourself um, because nobody is going to do it for you. Um, so that's how I grew up to be sort of independent. But um, as I got involved in politics and just human rights, um, then I got into environmental and then um, everything else that's wrong with this world. And of course we have schools that try to inspire you and they say you can be whatever you want. And so, you know, I said, well, I want to be the person who helps fix the place we live in. <laughs> Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> um, yeah, it's a difficult answer, I think. Um, I I feel really inspired by the community. Oftentimes, I think that's really where I, I draw a lot of my inspiration from. Um, when I moved to Kitsap County, 
a lot of the farmers that I work with are really involved in social justice organizing and work. And, um, and so, yeah, um, it just really always inspires me to see other people who care for their community and who invest their time in it. And um, it's not anything that is not just like individual centered, right? It's great to celebrate the individual, but um, really the progress that we can make is collective. And so collective work always just brings me a lot of joy. Food brings me a lot of joy. <laughs> That's really one of my big inspirations, growing, growing vegetables, growing plants, being out outside. Um, it, it's what balances me between doing this work and um, and just like keeping the fire alive. Yeah. Thank you both so, so, so much. You two inspire me. So that would be my answer to that question tonight. <laughs> In the most cheesy, um, cheesy possible way. Um, <laughs> are there any, any final thoughts you'd like to share or anything you'd like to challenge us to do? Or, you know, just, just anything that people on this call should try to keep in mind or try to work towards or support you in some way, just, you know, final thoughts. Yeah, um, definitely. Uh, I would encourage people to join care or to attend a meeting, you know, talk to us, reach out, re reach out to us, email us. Um, and I think we can probably post that in the chat or something. Um, yeah, I think that we definitely need more allies and members and um, it would be great to have more people involved. And what is the website? I'll go ahead and put it in the chat. Uh, Alejandra typed it in. It's care.org at gmail.com. Perfect. Yeah. You, Ali, do you have anything? Thank you so very much. <laughs> <laughs> cool. I really appreciate this. I, I, I love this series because um, it, it just feels like right now we're all in like an echo chamber. So those who like are not op or have not like been in this like diversity or open to these viewpoints that these people are here um, really interested and open to this. So I really appreciate to every one of you who are listening right now and in the future. So thank yeah. you. <laughs> Me too. Yeah, thank you so thank much. You. Thank you both so, so much for taking the time and for sharing so generously with us. It's an honor and a privilege, and I can't wait to see what happens next. I'm going to join CARE tonight. <laughs> <laughs> and um, Alejandra, best of luck with college. You're going to do amazing stuff. I can't wait to see you running this country. I'm really excited. Most female president. <laughs> All right. We'll take care, everyone. We'll have this video up. If anybody wants to share it, it'll be on the Bainbridge Island Museum of Arts YouTube channel, um, probably by tomorrow morning. So go ahead and find that there. And we'll just go ahead and sign off. Thanks, everyone, so, so much. <laughs>